Hey darts fans, that's Timo Newman here, the transporter. Welcome, after a long absence, to the good ship Undarted Waters. Belated Happy New Year to everyone out there. Um, our regular viewers and maybe some new viewers to this channel. Um, just a little bit of little fish there. Uh, just had some fish for my supper actually, some sardines. That's another little bit of fish with these sawn off flights. And that's what I want to talk about in this short video today is about how come you can throw darts with flights like these, but you can also throw darts with regular flights and so on. Although maybe not everyone can. And I think it's to do with the delivery. And I want to just talk about that using some physics in a minute. Before I do that though, let me turn off this board light here. Um, the last video I made was before Christmas and it was a pretty unusual video for this channel because it was me basically saying that I was going to boycott the PDC because I was so um, irritated by the crowd behavior in the early rounds of the World Darts Championship and um, the fact that the commentators didn't mention it, the referees couldn't really do anything about it, the PDC didn't really seem to be bothered and some really good players were getting knocked out more from being booed and whistled and heckled rather than by playing badly because they weren't on form. And so I didn't think that was real sport. And I made a video about that and I said I would boycott it and I did. So I've not seen one second of darts footage um, ever since that video. I've had a lot of spare time over the Christmas break to pursue other things, been actually reading up on some quantum mechanics and also um, reading a really good book that someone bought me for Christmas called English Journey by J.B. Priestley. And I just mentioned that it was written in the 1930s. And it's where this author and playwright J.B. Priestley just drives around England, visiting different towns, particularly industrial towns, and just talking about what he finds. It's really, really interesting. Um, but anyway, that's beside the point. Um, so I, believe it or not, I do not know who won the World Darts Championship. Can you believe that? Um, it's absolutely insane. I've just avoided the news. I didn't want to find out until I made the first video for the new year. Um, I've got a, a friend at work who's a big darts fan and I saw him today and he was dying to talk about the World Darts Championship. But I said, no, please don't tell me until I make this video. So tomorrow, um, my pal... Uh, Stuart and I will have a good old talk about um, the World Darts Championship. He'll tell me what happened, because I don't know. Um, and he'll tell me about the Premier League lineup, all this stuff that I'm completely in the dark about. Anyway, um, I'll probably try and find out what, what happened after I make this video. Although if you'd like to comment me and tell me, that would be great too. Um, so let's go back to the physics. How come you can take dart flights... Um, I, won't, I don't have one to hand right now, but you know the regular shape of a dart flight. Basically snip off the sides of it and um, cut the top off and you get this little stump. But it's perfectly good dart to throw. Okay, and how, how is that? And I think I've made a video in the past. I'll, I'll put a link in the description below where I had three different darts with a, a full flight, like a in-between flight and then a really short flight, stumpy flight like this. And I got a 180 with them without, to be honest, too much effort. And it's like, well, how come? What's going on with that? Because I know that some players are really into their equipment, really into their flights. Um, I've seen videos. I think Matthew Edgar made a video with a colleague of his where they tried different flights and they really struggled with flights that they were not used to because, you know, professionals really get into the groove with certain flights. So let's get the whiteboard and just talk about like what's going on with all this. I think what I'm going to do is make a longer video on this topic because I don't want this to be a, a long one just to start off the new year. But I just want to get the general idea across because um, it's something that I've been like scratching my head about for the last few weeks. And I think I've, I think I understand what's going on. And it's all to do with aerodynamics, actually. All right. So let's how should we start this? Let's just start with not a dart, but just an object that is moving through the air. So it could be like a plane, it could be a dart or whatever, but let's just say it's some object. And I'm just gonna draw a rectangle for that object, okay? 
So there's an object that's moving, moving through the air, traveling in this direction. Okay, and it's just surrounded by air. And if you've watched that uh, Physics of Dark Flight series, you'll know some of the, the, the physics background to this. But basically, the forces that are acting on this, one of them is gravity pulling it downward. But the other force that's acting on this is, is drag. And that's just the viscosity of the air. It's like, a, it's like air is like a fluid with very low density. But if you imagine throwing a dart um, in water, how quickly that would slow down because of the viscosity. So air has viscosity too, and it pulls backwards. So there's a force that we call air resistance, which is pulling back in the opposite direction. And that's why when you throw, say, a, a cricket ball, you know, it doesn't go as far as you'd like, or if you hit a golf ball, it doesn't go as far as you'd like, you know, because it, it basically slows down and it kind of falls more, it goes like this, but then it kind of falls precipitously at the end and that's air resistance or, or drag or, um, and so on causing that, okay. So in this situation I've drawn here, there's two, the, the thing I want to get across here, there's actually two different kinds of drag. There's something called um, skin friction which I'll do in green, and the skin friction is where the air sort of clings to the surface of the object, and that kind of pulls it back. And then the other thing is called, um, what do they call it, form drag, and that's to do with the cross-section that the object presents to the air. So, like, if you design, like, um, well, that's an unhappy subject, but let's say a torpedo that's going to go through the water, you obviously don't give it a big blunt, face right you give it a very narrow face and that reduces what's called the form drag so if i do the form drag in red that's basically the air pushing into this surface okay that's called form drag now you have there's two different kinds of drag okay but you also have in aerodynamics something called lift and that's how airplanes fly is because their wings are um, have a certain shape which is called the aerofoil and they have a certain angle which gives the plane lift. Now in the situation I've drawn here there is no lift because the lift would only apply if the object is tilted with respect to its direction of motion. So let's redraw this picture now but now let's have this object at an angle but it's still going in the same direction. So it's traveling in this direction just as before, but now it's at an angle, okay? So it's kind of interesting what's going on here. You've still got the, the form drag, okay? Which is gonna be acting in this direction. And you've got the skin friction. But you've also got a new force here, which is that because it's tilted now, this object's kind of moving like this, so this was doing this, but this one's moving. And you can imagine if you move your hand through the air, so if you do this motion with your hand, you, you don't feel any much air on your palm, but if you do this motion with your hand, you feel the air on your palm. So if you tilt the object with respect to its direction, all that air is hitting that face. So the air is hitting this face here and you get lift from that. And the lift acts perpendicular to the direction of motion. So let me just draw that direction of motion a bit more accurate there. It's in the same as before, okay? And the, the drag will slow it down opposite to that, but because it's tilted now, you're gonna have a significant um, force that's gonna act perpendicular, and that would be lift. All right. So why am I telling you about this block that's moving either parallel with the motion or tilted with the motion? Well, it's all to do with how does a person deliver a dart, okay? So when you deliver that dart, are you holding it, it's, it's, going, it's going to go in this direction, are you holding it parallel to that or do you have it tilted, all right? Do you tilt it with the direction of motion? If you tilt it either this way or this way, You've got this situation and you're going to have lift is going to come into the equation. All right. So let's get rid of these pictures and let's just go back to a dart now. 
and the approximate trajectory of the dart, if it's thrown from here to the board, the dart's going to have sort of like a parabola, we called it. Right, that's the, that's the approximate kind of um, trajectory that the dart will take. And if you, if, you th if you throw the dart parallel of its orientation with the direction of um, the throw, you're basically minimizing the form drag and you're minimizing the lift, all right? So if your dart is like this, parallel to that direction, then it's nearly all, the only force really on that dart is skin friction, pretty much. That's just over the surface of the dart. Very, very little form drag or lift. Why is that important? It's important because these drag forces and lift forces are much more, are much stronger if you have bigger cross section of uh, surface for the air to act on, particularly the form drag and the lift. So, you know, obviously, like if you had an airplane with wings that were like the, the width of this pen, you wouldn't fly because there's nothing for the lift force to act on. So a plane wing has to have a certain size for the lift force to act upon. So the bigger your flights, the more sensitive the dart becomes to lift and form drag Therefore, the more sensitive it becomes to the angle that the dart has when you release it. So in this kind of perfect situation where it's parallel, it doesn't actually matter whether you have this kind of flight or just a little stumpy flight or whatever, because, because it's parallel, the lift, there's no lift essentially, very little lift. So if we do Let's have someone throwing a dart now where they throw it at an angle of orientate. The orientation of the dart is at an angle to the direction of the dart. So they're holding it in there. I'm, I'm exaggerating the picture, but they're holding it in their hand, say like this, and it's going to go in this direction, but you see it's at an angle. So I want to throw it in this direction, but the dart's at an angle. There's a lot of surface area there for form drag and lift to act upon. Okay. That means that the, the dart is much more sensitive to the flight, all right? A big flight will have a much bigger lift and form drag than, than the flight I've got right now. So in this situation, this dart is going to very rapidly change its orientation, okay? It's going to be pushed very strongly. Um, there's going to be a lot of lift force acting on this, this flight here. It's going to very rapidly be pushed into a um, more parallel orientation, okay? But in that initial period, there's lift and form drag going on. So that's not a problem in itself. If you always deliver the dart with the same angle and you always use the same flight, you will adapt to this. So you've got more complicated motion of the orientation of the dart in the initial trajectory. But if you always use the same flight and have the same angle, you'll just adapt to it because we all adapt to all of the peculiarities of our throw. But what it means is if you change your flights or if you have three darts with three different flights, you won't be able to throw them in the same place pretty much. This is, this is the physics that I understand of the situation. So I think that the fact that without having really trained to do this, the fact that when I throw darts, I don't seem to notice much difference for different flights and so on, or even these really sawn off flights. What it must mean is that the way I was tr training is that I'm delivering the dart very parallel to the direction of motion. Okay. And in one of those physics of dart flight videos, I talked about um, smoothness and naturalness, um, how in nature, nature always aims to sort of minimize certain things. I talked about optimization, all of those kind of concepts came in. And I think probably my physics background when I was learning to play darts was telling me to aim for smoothness. So everything I try and do as much as I can, because no one can do this perfectly, is to try and deliver the dart in a very smooth way 
that probably means that I'm naturally throwing it parallel to the direction of which I'm delivering it, which means there's very little lift or form drag, which means that my darts don't really care what's on the end. If there's nothing on the end, you have a problem though, because if you have nothing on the end at all, there will be no, um, be, be, be no form drag at all. And what will happen is the dart will actually not change its orientation. So if you have nothing on the end, that dart is not really gonna, gonna flop over and it's gonna hit the board like this. And that's why when you throw a dart without a flight, often it just bounces off the board sort of, you know, in a really horrible way because it's actually, it hasn't tilted over. So the dart will always have a little bit of form drag and that will serve to push the tail up because the tail's always presenting a little bit of cross section to the air, that form drag will push the tail up and it will, it will go through that trajectory, okay? So the dart will essentially give or take, follow its nose because of that little bit of form drag on the tail, but it's be very, very small. You know, I calculated the size of these forces. Um, I never presented it in the videos because it's really, really messy. But basically what I was stunned at is that the size of the forces for a dart thrown like this are absolutely minuscule, but they're just enough, I think, to tilt the dart over during flight. Um, it's only when you throw them at a bigger angle that those forces get 10 times bigger as soon as you have an appreciable angle between the direction of travel and the orientation of the dart. And that's when you get that great sensitivity to the kind of flight that you're using. Also, it will depend on the length of the stem, okay? Because once the dart starts to move to be tilted, you have what's called a torque, a rotational force acting, and that torque will be much bigger if you have a longer stem. So I think that's, I think that's all I'll say on this topic, actually. Um, and I can go into much more detail about this if people are interested. But it, I'd be very curious if there are folks out there who are really into equipment and really into very particular stems and very particular flights. I'd be very interested if they monitor or film themselves throwing a dart, do they have this situation here? I've exaggerated it, but do they have an angle between the orientation of the dart and the delivery? Okay, I'd be very interested to see. And maybe if they try to get rid of that, not saying that they should do that, but if they just, as an experiment, try to get rid of that and see if the sensitivity to the kind of flight vanishes, that would be a really interesting finding. Okay, I don't think the darts manufacturers will be very happy because, you know, if people are discovering a way to basically have a universal flight, which doesn't depend, um, you know, on basically how you throw. I mean, I mean, why did I cut these off? It's just because you can group the darts much, much better there's very little flight flight interference so the grouping is much better and you know you don't get as much it's like bounce outs and stuff like that okay so let me end there um just want to remind everyone it's 2026 darts 26 and may the 3rd 7 40 p.m i think uk time but if folks would like to um work with me to kind of organize some kind of fun global launch of Darts 26 on May the 3rd this year, please let me know. I can maybe try and set up a website. You know, if there's enough interest, we, we could maybe try and buy a domain name, set up a website. Could be really fun because Darts 26 could be a really fantastic way to, to, to give an injection of new interest into Darts. Right, so with that, I hope everyone's having a decent New Year so far. It's absolutely freezing cold up here in Scotland. Um, not much fun in the early mornings at the start of a shift, but hopefully within a week it will warm up again. Hope it's warmer where you are. We get three darts at the Oki, make them count, and I'll see you next time.